Welcome to Whiskey Politics, episode 99. I'm Dave Sussman, your host and purveyor at whiskeypolitics.net, where we interview political luminaries, newsmakers, and insiders. You can find our series at ricochet.com. You can also find and subscribe to us on iTunes. And if you can kindly take a moment and give Whiskey Politics a five-star rating and comment, it really does help. Would, would, would We appreciate every single comment and especially those five-star ratings. iTunes looks for that. You can also find me on Twitter at David Sussman. We appreciate you being here and also want to thank our sponsor, ManCrates.com, which makes buying unique gifts for every man in your life fun and easy. Easy and fun. Folks, Valentine's Day is a week away. So guys, make sure you get a gift you really want. Or ladies or others, give a gift your man will truly appreciate. Go to ManCrates.com as they have an awesome collection of curated gifts guys love. Go to ManCrates.com and get a special 5% discount. Just type ManCrates.com slash whiskey. That's ManCrates.com slash whiskey. For most of our listeners, Victor Davis Hansen needs no introduction. If you don't know VDH, you are missing some of the most insightful, intuitive perspective today. Doing my prep for Victor Davis Hansen has been both easy and challenging. Easy in that VDH is everywhere. From his interviews with Peter Robinson at Uncommon Knowledge, the Classicist podcast at Hoover Institute with Troy Senek, the countless speeches at universities and media outlets, uh, there's a lot of Victor out there. The challenge is just that. There's a lot of Victor out there, and he covers almost every topical issue you can imagine, whether it's immigration and DACA, the Democrats' prospects for 2018 and 2020, the cultural elites, both Democrats and the GOP, uh, Russia, China, North Korea, Trump, history, World War II. <laughs> Those are just a few. Well, guess what? We've got Victor Davis Hansen for an hour. Let's see if we can cover them all. Victor Davis Hansen is an American military historian, columnist, former classics professor, and a scholar of ancient warfare. He was a professor of classics at California State University, Fresno, and is currently a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution, as well as a visiting professor at Hillsdale College. Hansen was awarded the National Humanities Medal in 2007 by President George W. Bush. Unlike most everyone he writes about, Victor is also a farmer in Central California. He is a widely read author of dozens of books, and you can find his columns everywhere, including The National Review, Town Hall, American Greatness, and his most recent book is The Second World Wars, How the First Global Conflict Was Fought and Won. I think actor and prolific Twitter guy James Woods encapsulated it best in a tweet this week. He said, Victor Davis Hanson is arguably our greatest living political and cultural essayist. His words ring out like a firing squad, ending the treachery of liberal elitism with the squeeze of a trigger. He is an unassuming genius and a great American. With that introduction, pour yourself a drink, relax, and enjoy the Whiskey Politics interview with VDH. Welcome, Victor. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Let's get straight to it. I wanted to discuss the FISA warrants and the Still dossier because there was breaking news this morning regarding newly released text messages showing President Obama did ask for updates on the Hillary Clinton email investigation. This, at best, is a major inconsistency with his own words, as in 2016, on an interview with Chris Wallace, then-President Obama forcefully guaranteed he was staying out of the FBI probe. Here it is. I can guarantee that, and, and I can guarantee that not because I give uh, Attorney General Lynch a directive. That is institutionally how we have always operated. I do not talk to the Attorney General about pending investigations. I do not talk to FBI directors about uh, pending investigations. The, uh, we have a strict line uh, and always have maintained it, previous so, presidents. Ju just to button this up. I guarantee it. You? I guarantee that there is no political influence in any investigation conducted by the Justice Department or the FBI, not just in this case, but in any case. And she will be full stop, period. And she will be treated no differently. Guaranteed, full stop, 
nobody gets treated differently when it comes to the Justice Department because nobody is above the law. Guarantee, guarantee, guarantee. Nobody gets treated differently when it comes to the Justice Department because nobody is above the law. What are we looking at here? Well, I think we're looking at two things. One is what you suggested, um, that he's inconsistent. Remember when Trump tweeted in March of 2017 that his wires were tapped in Trump Tower, a Obama spokesman came out and said, you know, prior Obama spokesman, spokesman, the official communicate from Obama said, we never interfered with what they called an independent investigation. That appears to be wrong now when he says he wanted the FBI, according to Mr. Strzok, to be informed of what was going on. So it's, that, that's a problem because it, it erodes his credibility. And second, I think we're getting closer to taboo territory. And by taboo, I mean Barack Obama, because there's two things here. One, he had a history that was never really examined while president for a variety of reasons of weaponizing the IRS under Lois Lerner's division or monitoring James Rosen of Fox News or Associated Press report, reporters or when he left office, vastly expanding the number of government agencies that had access to FISA intercept surveillance transcripts and allowing them to not only look at them, but unmask the names, and then the names mysteriously had appeared. So my point is that he didn't have a good record on civil liberties, and it was never really questioned. And now when we get information, we see that it, in specific terms, that applied to being involved with the investigation of Hillary Clinton. I think your listeners will remember that he prematurely assured the country that she hadn't done anything criminally suspect in the middle of the campaign. And now I think we're starting to see that James Comey, uh, Andrew McCabe, Lisa Page, Peter Strzok, uh, James Baker, the FBI counsel, Loretta Lynch, who met on the tarmac with Bill Clinton. We, we've got a number of high-ranking DOJ and FBI officials that were involved in politicizing investigations both into Hillary Clinton and into Donald Trump. And the irony of all of this is that there's probably Russian collusion, but it's not Donald Trump finagling with Russian interest, but rather Russian interests supplying data, fake data, to... Uh, Christopher Steele, which, who was being paid by Hillary Clinton, and then that dossier found its way into the FBI. And I think the great unknown is we don't know today whether the FBI followed through with its intentions to pay for that dossier. They said that they were, but then they backed out. But they have admitted that they paid reimbursements for the expenses. But if they, if they turn out that they paid for a document that they knew was uh, – created by Hillary Clinton, and then they used that paid document to go to a FISA court and didn't tell the court that the basis for surveilling American citizens was based on something they bought from a political campaign. I, I think it would be pretty bad. It's bad now. But it would be worse. Yeah, it does look bad, and his name is now in the center of all of this, and he's actually kind of strangely gone quiet over the past few days. But a lot of people are wondering how much of this all started from the Obama Oval Office. Maybe not directly, but very likely through his DOJ. But what of this final executive order given by Obama in his final days, which in your words says this, his final order dramatically enlarged 17 government agencies' legal authority to surveil U.S. citizens. Do you think investigations will eventually point to Barack Obama himself at the center of wrongdoing? I think it probably will. It has to because there's too many people involved that reported directly to him, whether it's Loretta Lynch or in this case, um, if we find out that Samantha Power and Ben Rhodes and Clapper and Brennan and Susan Rice all were requesting surveillance through FISA court that was obtained through the FISA court, and then they were requesting dozens if not hundreds of unmaskings of the particular American citizens' names, and then those names found their way. It's, an, it's just implausible to think that Obama was not aware of that, especially when we get these tidbits that he wants to be informed of an FBI investigation. But that was a Reagan-era 
FISA, uh, excuse me, it was an expansion of surveillance. And it's been, my question is, it was okay during the Reagan administration. Bush altered a little bit after 9-11. Obama was fine with it for eight years. Why, after Trump was elected, just a few days before he was inaugurated, did he vastly expand the scope of the people who would have access to FISA intercepts? And I think the answer is is pretty clear that, and we I think we can illustrate that by a minor DOD official, Evelyn Farkas, I think her name was, who blurted out on cable news that they were desperate to get uh, classified information about supposed Russian um, Trump collusion into as many hands as possible, including those on the Hill. And I think we've seen the result of that in a lot of comments that Adam Schiff has made. So I think this collusion idea was a fallback position that after it did not work as what uh, they called insurance, Peter Strzok said that, in the, and they said insurance because Hillary was far ahead in the campaign and they didn't think they need it. That's what insurance is, something that Peter Strzok says you really don't think you're going to need, if you, like dying before 40, but you have it there. And then when she lost, they look, looked at it again and said, oh my gosh, this is something that will be valuable to erode the credibility in the Trump administration. So they doubled down and, and continued to do FISA after the election request. So after the election there was obviously still that interim period and uh and correct me if i'm wrong what i understand you saying is that essentially the enlargement of the 17 government agencies legal authority to surveil u.s citizens was uh, what a mop-up operation just to protect themselves no well it could be that but i think what it wasn't so much that he authorized them to to um expand their own investigations, or that might be an, uh, a result of it. I think what it was the result, the intent was that they felt they had salacious material on Donald Trump. And while that had not worked through leaks uh, to derail his efforts to be president, that it would erode confidence, not only in the transition, but his presidency. And one way to ensure that was to make sure that you had as many people as possible, as Farkas illustrated, having access to something that they would have never had uh, a security clearance to look at. And so the more outgoing administration people who could look at this, the more likely it is that they would leak. And then, of course, Barack Obama would have plausible deniability. He said, I just mm -hmm. expanded things because, and that's what happened. That, that's in fact what happened because after that order, as you remember in, in February, March, and April, that's when the collusion narrative got so hot that it would lead eventually to the appointment of Robert Mueller. Both Watergate and Iran-Contra were multiple-year affairs. Uh, FISA-gate, and I hate adding gate to everything here, but uh, that's what it's being called. You say it may last longer, given that the media this time around are not a watchdog, but an, an enabler of government misconduct. It, what, what are we looking at here as far as the difference goes between the early 1970s and today with the media and this uh, investigation? Well, this is sort of an underground media investigation that when you look at the mainstream news, NBC, ABC, CBS, they're not, they're not even covering it. Or to the degree that they're covering it, they're still committed to the fake dossier uh, narratives. Mm -hmm. If you look at our blue chip newspapers that were so prominent during Watergate and Iran-Contra, where is the New York Times, the Washington Post? In fact, you could make the argument, I think, defensible that they're actually on the, on the side of suppressing um, the release of documents and criticizing and trying to defame people in the Congress who are trying to get to the bottom of the of this mess, whereas in Watergate they were just the opposite. So, if we're going to learn about this, it's not going to come from NPR or ABC or CNN or the Washington Post. It's going to have to come from Circa News or. Um, the Daily Caller, or Ricochet, it's going to have to come from the blogos blogosphere. And so it's sort of a renegade populist effort uh, to get the news out. And this is ironic because we were told that the prime directive of the mainstream news is always transparency and the removal of darkness, as the Washington Post's motto is. That it's going to be let the light shine, but it surely doesn't want the House Intelligence Committee to get out information. And that and committee for about a year has been uh, 
hitting roadblocks every time they've requested information from James Comey or Rod Rosenstein. We had Peter Schweitzer on the show a couple of weeks ago, and before the election, he originally thought that no matter who won, he felt secure that there would be investigations about Uranium One and her unsecure server. However, and this is uh, per the discussion we had just uh, less than two weeks ago, he now feels that the Clintons, if she had won, would have somehow been exempted from any criminal exposure. Do you agree with this? I wrote a column to that effect, and I went one step further and that is, we look at the motivations or the mentalities of the various actors in this scandal uh, from the point of view that um, they thought they wouldn't be punished if likely what would happen, they figured, was a Hillary Clinton election. But I think it's a little bit more insidious than that, that if you're Andrew McKay, why would you continue to investigate Hillary Clinton when three months earlier your wife got somewhere between 450000 and $700,000 in campaign contributions from a Clinton-affiliated PAC? Or why uh, would James Comey, for example, publish or list or circulate basically a memo of exoneration before he had even interviewed Hillary Clinton? And, of course, they were worried that... Um, that if Clinton were elected, they might be punished had they been more muscular. But I think the real motivation was they thought they were going to be rewarded. Right. So I think somebody like Comey would say, well, Hillary, remember, I didn't really, I excused you before I even interviewed you. Or McCabe would have said, hey, my wife was trying to, she did her best in hillbilly country in Virginia, but she just couldn't pull it off. But I, I was on your team on the email thing. And that mentality affected sort of a schizophrenic James Comey went back and forth, but ultimately he understood that he would be rewarded. And, and I think Loretta Lynch thought that there was nothing wrong being in the tarmac because Hillary would not only be president, but she would be the next attorney general as the Clintons themselves leaked. leaked. Yeah, which is incredible. And for our listeners, uh, that tarmac incident was not supposed to be made public. It was it was a pure accident that there was a photographer and a journalist from a local newspaper there that day. That shouldn't have happened. Do you believe that uh, no. Loretta uh, Loretta Lynch and Bill Clinton were talking about this? I mean, half an hour talking about grandkids, right? Oh, yes. yes. Well, I mean, does anybody believe that two private jets just bump into each other on a tarmac and then two people get out and say, wow, that's, look at that jet. I recognize it. That's Loretta Lynch's. And she says, ah, oh, what do you know? That's Bill Clinton's jet. I have not, we haven't talked about our grandkids. Let's go talk to them. That, that, that doesn't happen. Right. And then if it were to happen, they wouldn't be adverse to have anybody talking about it. No, they, they met because they wanted to know what the ground rules were for Hillary Clinton. And I mean that euphemistically. What Bill Clinton was telling her is there's a 90% chance as a New York Times was reporting at that time that Hillary Clinton was going to be elected and you're going to be the next DOJ or you're going to be fired and it's up to you to make the necessary adjustments. That's pretty obvious what happened. And so we know that she sort of said to James Comey, you're running things, which is highly unethical to tell an investigative uh, an official that you're not only going to investigate, but then you're going to make the decision as if you were a prosecutor about whether to pursue it or not. And no FBI agent has ever done that. That's not their purview. And I'm going to abdicate, but I'm not going to quite abdicate because I'm going to look back at what you do and be looking over your shoulder and, ah, oh, by the way, I don't want you to use the word investigation at all. So she would probably say to Hillary Clinton, I had to, I, look, I did a great job. I gave the appearance of transparency, but you know what? When you were running for office, they never used the word investigation. That was thanks to me. And then I need to be attorney general. That's, I think, the mindset that what we're dealing with. I think we can't underestimate, in other words, that, I mean, Nate Silver, I think, a week before the election said there was a 25% chance, 29% that Donald Trump was going to be elected president. And he was just absolutely trounced by the liberal media for being so favorable to, to Donald Trump and to create such optimism. 29% chance, he said, where everybody else was saying less than 10 yeah, we we forget the mindset in um, late October of 2016, and I, I know someone who wrote that Trump had a good chance of winning. I I would get phone calls and letters and things that you lost your mind, you're pathetic and things like that. So yeah, New York Times had him at 10 percent the morning of the election. Yeah, 
Yeah, now, what I what of her circle? What of her circle now? You uh, apparently Samantha Power, Susan Rice, and others made requests to read surveilled transcripts of Trump associates. Uh, they unmasked names. They leaked them to pet reporters. Uh, what about Cheryl Mills, Huma Abedin, who some mysteriously for some reason decided to no longer uh, divorce her uh, her, pet, her jailed pedophilic husband? What about De Debbie Wasserman Schultz? I mean, all of their efforts to protect Hillary from criminal liability with the email investigation. Where does this all end up as we peel back the layers of this onion? I don't know. It'll be interesting. That's a good question because. I think they're going to be turning on the FBI because they're going to, Debbie Wasserman Schultz would say, well, I, I didn't want the FBI, you know, looking into the leaks or the tampering of, of, of our communications and they made the decision not to. So we just use a private person or maybe Cheryl Mills would say, you know what? Every client tries to give as little information as possible, but if the FBI doesn't really want to ask or probe, it's not my business. Mm -hmm. And so I think, what they're going to say is, uh, uh, sure, I was a partisan of Hillary Clinton. I do everything. I do it again. Uh, but I didn't actually lie. And if you're angry that I was not treated by other witnesses, I was treated in a better and more favorable fashion, then you better go ask the FBI about that. And then they, that'll be interesting because the FBI will either have to do one or two things. We'll have to admit to culpability and unequal application of the law. They're going to have to say so-and-so told me to do this, whether that was Andrew McCabe or James Comey. And then they, maybe this is how Watergate and Iran Contra unravel. As you go up, each person says, somebody told me and somebody higher, somebody higher and higher. And then it goes to the top. But a little, again, we're in a different landscape because the media is not trying to find out the truth. And you're going to get to a point where Barack Obama is absolutely sacrosanct for a variety of reasons. But culturally and uh, socially in in the media nobody wants to touch him and he's exempt so i think it'll stop when it gets close to incriminating him do you believe the ultimate downfall for the clinton and the obama team was their hubris I, you wrote instead the clinton and obama officials believed that it was within the administrative state's grasp and their perceived political interest not just to beat but to destroy and humiliate Donald Trump and, by extension, all the distasteful deplorables and irredeemables he supposedly had galvanized. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, that speech might have cost Hillary Clinton. That speech being the irredeemable and deplorable speech might have cost her the election. But that followed, that was just an expansion of Obama's campaign, his own version called the Klinger speech. And I remember the little video where Obama says, the least Donald Trump, I got elected and I was president. You And he throws down the cell phone and it breaks on the pavement. Yeah, so there was a, Jimmy Kimmel. Was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was this sense of arrogance that this guy is a buffoon. These uh, deplorables, are, they're just, they don't know what they're doing. This guy has no chance. He's going to destroy. And it was amplified, to be frank, that the luminaries of the conservative pundocracy the Weekly Standard people, many of the people I write with at National Review, Commentary Magazine, they were all weighing in that Trump was not only unfit to be president, but he would destroy the Republican Party. And then their duty after the election, because they assumed he had zero chance, was sort of to take the ashes and make this Republican phoenix fly out of it under their tutelage. So we would get back to a Jeb Bush uh, type of of sober and judicious George H.W. Bush Republican Party again. That's what that's what everybody that was on question. They would lecture. I, I, I won't mention any particular names that I talked to a lot of them in there. They would take a finger and shake at you and say, you guys are destroying the Republican Party and it's going to be sober and judicious people like ourselves after this landslide's over and we lose the House and Senate that have to reconstruct it. And they really did believe that. And I think that also fueled into, they were almost useful idiots in the sense that suddenly we saw, I think it was around September, to, I think you noticed as well, that suddenly MSNBC and CNN had a whole stable of Republican former Bush supporters that were on TV night and day explaining that Donald Trump was not only unfit, but was going to be a disaster for their party. Yep, we did notice, and... Uh... <laughs> 
the ricochet uh, boards lit up. I mean, there was a lot of arguing about it, you know, and I want to I want to ask you about the elites and the election. But before I ask you, I, I want to ask you about your column in American Greatness as well that just came out this week, which was amazing. Um, but before I ask you about it, I've always assumed I've, I've read you for a long time. I've always assumed you write so well that your voice says the things that so many of your readers think and you articulate because you have your foot in the real world. Many writers of politics, they live, they dine, they party in D.C. But you're on terra firma. You're on a farm in central California, a part of the state, the elites in Silicon Valley and L.A. scoff at. I remember a speech you gave sometime in the last year, whereby you as a farmer stated that any minority on your farm that could speak English, they voted Trump. I think that makes sense, but can you elaborate on that? Well, I think a lot of people uh, that write that write our commentary don't understand what motivates Americans. So I'll give you an example. I got home from Washington at a Bradley Foundation late last night. I, t- I, I did a Fox News thing. I, I talked to some people from the Hoover, but I'm sitting right now looking out my window on my farm, and uh, I saw some people this morning. How many people, if I said to them, oh, I'm talking to the Hoover Institution, I was at a Bradley meeting, I was, um, do you think they care? They not only don't know anything about it, to them it's irrelevant. They have no care at all. And what, they're, what I'm trying to say is when I talked to somebody this morning about almonds, or a guy was putting in a hot water heater on the farm. That's what they worry about. And I don't think that our people understand that, but they're not that important. I'm not that important. You're not that important. But they have some kind of weird conclusion that because they're on cable news or that people, they have a column or that they feel that they, in the New York, Washington quarter, they know this senator or that house member or this author or this celebrity that, that somehow uh, they that's authentic or that's a, a, a um, badge of achievement. So we've entitled all these people. They all have the proper degrees. They went to the proper universities, but they never ask themselves, do they know anything about America? Do they have any tangible achievement? And I think that was what the election was about. A lot of people were saying, you know what? I want somebody to come in like Samson, take each arm around the pillar and knock it down. And it's not quite nihilistic because they wanted an agenda to replace the old one. But I really think that these people still haven't caught on, that they don't understand what's going on. And they 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 really do believe that if Trump is polling 41% in the real clear politics average, that that shows you that 50% of the people in the United States hate him. And they don't get it. And every time I talk to somebody out my window who's Hispanic, who's for Trump, he looks down and looks both ways so that nobody sees what he's saying. But it doesn't mean that he's not going to vote for him. And if that's true in California, it has to be true in other places, and I think it is. Yeah, yeah. And being in central California is practically a different state uh, for those folks outside of California. It isn't just all yeah. palm I mean, trees. It's more right wing than. Yeah. 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 I, that's people don't understand about Central California and the foothills of the Sierra. That it's not just conservative, but it's more conservative in places like Idaho or or Montana yeah. or Utah. Yeah. Yeah. Which really district is uh, Devin Nunez uh, in? By the way, is he near you? Well, he's yes. I live in Southwest uh, Fresno County, and I'm a very strange district. I am two miles within David Valadeo, a Republican Portuguese American district and I vote and I'm one mile outside of Devin Nunes and I'm two miles in Jim Costa who's a liberal Democrat but three Portuguese American Congress people and I've been in Devin Nunes's district a lot depending on the proportioning and he lives about 20 miles I'm looking at the 99 freeway about a mile away and he he lives 20 miles down the road so I've, I've known him for almost 20 years but outside of politics yeah yeah safe district for him this year Oh, yeah. I mean, he has the local McClatchy, uh, the whole Sacramento and uh, Modesto and Fresno B are attacking him relentlessly, and they're trying to get candidates, and they're getting a lot of outside money. But his district of the three that I'm right at the nexus of is the most conservative. Valadeo, Valadeo I think, has a 55% 
uh, Democratic edge, but they're conservative Democrats, and he speaks fluent Spanish, and he's been a really good congressperson. And then liberal, liberal Fresno is Jim Costa. You know, most men I know are providers. We take care of our families and rarely think about the things we want. It's probably why we are so hard to buy gifts for. Now there's a place for both women and men to find great gifts for men. Whether you are looking for something for your husband, father, son, brother, friend, co-worker, really any man in your life. Introducing ManCrates.com, the only place to find awesome gifts guys love. How about a military care crate for the brave men and women serving? Or the Grill Master Crate? Or the Office Golf Crate? This isn't some cologne sampler, boring mug, or tie. ManCrates offers curated gift collections for every type of guy, from the sports fanatic to the home chef to the outdoorsman. Check out classics like the NFL Barware Crate and the Whiskey Appreciation Crate, or fresh takes on the traditional Valentine's gifts like uh, the Jerky Heart or the Salami Bouquet. Go to ManCrates.com. You will be amazed at the variety of options available. Pick the perfect gift, then wait for that magic moment. When the gift arrives, it comes in a real wooden crate. Now, there's really only one way to open it, and that's with the included crowbar. I got the personalized whiskey crate, which after using the crowbar to open, I enjoyed my favorite single malt in my personalized rock-bottom glass with a round ice sphere, thanks to the ice molds included. Along with the slate coasters, whiskey journal, and a great assortment of nuts, this was a great conversation piece. They have thousands of five-star reviews, and every gift comes with a complete satisfaction guarantee. So go to mancrates.com slash whiskey for 5% off. They don't offer a discount anywhere else. Get 5% off right now at mancrates.com slash whiskey. That's mancrates.com slash whiskey. You touch upon some of this that we're discussing right now in this column at American Greatness. It's called counterfeit elitism. You refer to both David Brooks and Bill Crystal, who seem to show disdain for the white working class and do not seem to differentiate between immigration and illegal immigration. Obviously, that's a page taken from the left and from the media. But uh, you, you continue, you can go deeper, you can look at George Will, you can look at Brett Stevens, all historically right of center, some will argue conservative, but would I read you right if I took from what you say here is they not so much have a disdain for Trump, but his voters? Yeah, well, I don't think I, it's correct to say seems like because David Brooks explicitly said that he prefers uh communities and landscapes where there's immigrants rather than just Americans, which he said were like East Germans. Now, how he knows that, he said he drove through some areas like that, um, but maybe he didn't get out of the car and live there for three months, or maybe he didn't put his child in a public school, or maybe he didn't have a kid trying to go to university that he neither had minority affirmative action status or his networks that he can make a phone call and, you know, facilitate admission. So, and then Bill Crystal at an American Enterprise Institute panel said, why is everybody worried about illegal immigration? And he said, but then, of course, he dropped the illegal and then went on with immigration when the so-called pathologies of the white working class would mean that you'd want to replace them anyway with immigrants, no matter how they came here. So it was just, that's what they said. And again, I think it comes from a romance with the so-called other that we have a lot of people whose income, whose influence, whose family and uh, professional ties are such that they're insulated from the ramifications of their own ideology. So it's really, I mean, if again, if I look, turn around, I look out the window, I'm looking right now down my avenue, a quarter mile away, there's a Mexican-American uh, family who sold their place to an illegal alien group, and they have just open their own dump illegally. And of course, the county feels why regulate when there's no money there and you get into a sanctuary city issue. So people come in every day and dump their trash. Across the street, a person has a yard sale, but his entire trees in the yard, the house, are covered with clothes that have been rained on twice, even in a drought, and they've been out there for six weeks. And then further down, a person has decided to collect porta potties. So he's got about 70 of them. And it's all illegal to put there. 
And so that's the world of illegal immigration. I know all the people there. They're nice. I try to have good relations with them. But if I want to put a solar panel on my home, I know that in California, I'm still, I, the panels have been on the roof for four months. And they're examining every regulation, every type of uh, insulation problem. And so they're looking for a misdemeanor by the company that put it in to find me even though everything was legal and there's all these felonies that I'm looking at that they're not able to even address. So they just let them go. So my question to, to David Brooks or Bill Crystal, would they have a different point of view if they were living across the street from those people? And it's not just me. It's that's the way life is in many places in the American Southwest. Do they ever find a body in a car on their property? Do they ever find a, uh, a cow thrown out with rigor mortis? Do they ever find puppies that have been in fights, uh, dog fights, as sacrificial victims with their innards torn out with a rope around their neck? Do they ever find wet diapers thrown out in their mailbox? They don't have that experience. And yet that's one of the, uh, the problems with the illegal aliens. And I don't mean to pick on them, but when you bring in 15 million people from an impoverished Oaxaca without legality, English, or a high school diploma, and immigration is not measured or meritocratic or legal, then what would one expect? It would be exactly, when David Brooks goes into the bank, does the person ahead of him make his mark because he can't write his name? Or do the tellers look at you in ex exasperation because the person who's ahead of you in the line is speaking language, and remember the tellers are all Mexican-American that they never heard before because it's an indigenous um, language from Oaxaca. So these are everything things in California where one of every four people was not born in the United States. And yet I'm only mentioning this not to be demagogic, but because we get these pontifications about their these expertise in illegal immigration by all these people who live in the coastal suburbs and and then they have absolute disdain or contempt for anybody who would object. It's almost like they're signal virtual signaling everybody at the expense of the white working class. And I'm, I think nobody speaks out for that. And because it's, it's a career ender when you do, because as soon as you do, you, you're labeled as a xenophobic, racist, nationalist, um, et cetera. But how do it you really answer? Makes people angry. It does make people angry. And how do you answer that? Because obviously those epithets been hurled in your direction every time you speak about this. Well, all I can say is I, I think we have to judge people on what they do rather than they say. So I live in a family whose uh, one brother is married to a Mexican-American person. My other brother has two Mexican-American children. Um, my wife's family is, is multiracial. And when I get up in the morning until I get over to Hoover each week, the only people, I mean that literally, I see are Mexican-Americans and people here illegally from Mexico. Obviously, I want it to work, this assimilation, integration, and a marriage. But if I didn't think it wouldn't work, I would move like most people do. So I didn't move, so I choose to stay here. And as we're speaking, I just had somebody last night drop a pit bull um, car into my yard. So I've got this pit bull with no license, no uh, dog vaccination running around my home right now. And when I hang up, I'm going to go either have to I don't know how I can get close to it. I'm getting shot. I mean, bits. So you have to have a gun and call the SPCA, and they will not come out because this is so common an occurrence. You have to deal with it on your own. So that's the world that I try to live in. And I think it's really good because it's a reminder to me all the time that I'm not an elite. I'm not special. Mm -hmm. No different than the person that lives next to me. I really do believe that. And I farm for a number of years with people that I write about, where I prune vines, I drive tractor, I work on spray rigs with Mexican-American people my entire life. And so to be told that you're racist or xenophobic by somebody who writes for the New York Times or somebody who writes for the Weekly Standard, it, just, it, it has zero effect on me. You, you wrote yesterday in the National Review that Never Trump movement is now mostly calcified as even some of its formerly staunch adherents concede, it's done in by the Trump record and the monotony of having to redefine a once welcomed conservative agenda as suddenly unpalatable due to Trump's crude fingerprints on it. 
Uh, do people see that? Do people see beyond what the uh, elitists from the, the coastal cities are saying about Trump? You, you, you refer to people being angry due to the reasons that you just talk about. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, when I read certain writers who I used to get along with very well, and they told me that it was essential, essential to drop the pretense about Palestinians being 70-year refugees refugees and not to allow the UN in its anti-Semitic racist rants against Israel continue or to end the charade about moving the uh, embassy to Jerusalem. And then when that's actually reified by Donald Trump, they say, they write that it's either irrelevant or that it's contaminated by his signature on it or uh, it's provocative. Or when I read people who've told me the signature issue of our time is restricting abortion, especially late-term abortion. And when you see what Trump has done on that, and they say that's not an issue anymore. So, and I think it was best exemplified by a never Trumper, Charles Cook, who nevertheless had a lot of integrity to point out that what Jennifer Rubin had written was completely opposite of what she used to, to write. And so the question is, to me, is what was their original political outlook? Was it, was it sort of liberal or was it conservative or what was it? Because now, whether you like him or not, you have the most conservative agenda since Ronald Reagan. And what is the argument that Trump didn't do it, that it, maybe Jim Mattis did it or Mnuchin did it, or was it uh, the people in the House did it? But you have to have some contorted argument to either say, okay, the agenda is fine, the message is good, I just don't like the messenger, and I don't like him to such an extent that it nullifies the message. Or you have to say, we've never had a president like this. So Grant might have been an alcoholic, uh, JFK may have, may, have, may have bedded virgins in the White House, LBJ may have exposed himself to his staff. We could go on and on. But Trump, is singular in this. And I, I don't think that's a persuasive argument. It really isn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about uh, elections all the time. You have an election and within a month, you're already talking about the next one. One of the big th roles that uh, voters played last time around in 2016 was that secret Trump voter, where it, it completely knocked out the credibility of the polling uh, organizations. Uh, they started asking people, instead of saying, will you be voting for Trump or Hillary, they're saying, who is your neighbor voting for? Because people didn't want to admit that they were voting for Trump due to his coarseness or whatever, being branded as a racist, deplorable. Do, does that carry to the midterms, do you think? It's hard to know. That's a very. That's another good question because nobody understands whether the phenomenon involves Trump supporters or just Trump himself. I have a feeling that it's not as uh, radical as in the case of Trump. That is that uh, there's more people will vote Republican than say they will, but not as many that would in the case of, as which was true in the 2016 election. So I think what's going to happen from now until November are three things. A, most presidents would say if the economy is stupid and 3% GDP would have coattails. I don't think that's true in, Trump, in Trump's case. I think he's going to have to have four or even higher GDP growth and below 4% unemployment and a stable high stock market. And I think that's possible, but he's going to need an extraordinary economy to, as all first presidents realize they lose seats in the house and he doesn't have a very big lead. So that's one thing. And then two, we don't know about these government shutdowns, whether there's going to be another one. I, it seems to me that if the Democrats push another shutdown, they're going to lose again. And that can help the people in the Congress that are against that. And then finally, there seems to be a bombshell where it's the Grassley letters or what you mentioned today about the Obama disclosures almost every day. And it seems like the House Intelligence Committee has a series, I don't know if they're calling them memos anymore, but disclosures that involve the State Department, that involve Samantha Power, Susan Rice on masking. And if that just continues the way that Iran Contra and Watergate, I, I think that the, uh, the Republicans have a 50-50 or better shot of retaining the House and maybe even get, picking up a seat or two in the Senate.
Yeah, so if we're looking towards the uh, 2018 uh, elections here, which, I mean, it's just, again, it's what everybody's talking about. You you wrote today in uh, the National Review. How do you, first of all, when you write, you don't just write three or four paragraphs. I mean, you write essays. <laughs> just Just as a personal question for you, how do you have the time every single day to write these? It's they're they're quite incredible. Well, you know, well, my children are gone, and I'm living out on a farm. And so what I do is, I go to the Hoover Institution for two days a week, and then I schedule maybe 13, 14 hours of meetings and fulfill my duties. But I notice that when I'm over in Palo Alto, I get nothing done. So then I come back, and I live on a farm, and I go upstairs or something, and I literally don't have a social life. I don't there's I don't go out to dinner. I don't network and you'd be surprised if you don't do that how many hours there are in a day so that's pretty much i don't have what i would call a traditional social life in the yeah. sense that i'm not in new york or what not that that's bad but if i'm in Palo Alto, people say hey let's go to dinner tonight or hey let's go have lunch or let's and i i think if you were to do that every day you wouldn't get anything done well it's it's to our benefit. I oh, just yeah. have to I, I just have to say it's to our benefit because I read you practically every single day. And no whether we're in town hall or National Review, American Greatness, it's I mean, you know, James Woods and I said it at the very beginning here nailed it. It's it, you're probably one of the greatest essayists uh, in, in in the world. But I, my Thank my you. question on today's article that you wrote, you're you're talking about the upcoming election, and is it all going to come down to the economy? Because you know that the Democrats are really going to be focused on impeachment. They just want to take this man out. If 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 we are under three percent GDP, if not higher, is Trump in trouble for the 2018s? Yeah, he's in trouble in the sense that every president, Obama included. Obama lost 60 seats plus, so I don't think he'll lose as many as Obama did. George Bush lost very few because it was after 9-11, but Reagan lost them. So he will he will suffer the fate that every president does in his first term. He'll lose 20 to 30 seats. If the economy is at 4% GDP or higher that last quarter, if unemployment in peacetime is below 4%, I don't think we've ever seen that since World War II. And if the stock market was recovers and is strong, but I think there's a good chance, as I said, he'll keep the house and pick up a couple of seats. And, and there's these wild court cards uh, about Robert Mueller. I would expect that Robert Mueller will sometime around September, October, late October, try to have some press conference where he announces some obstruction and some in the manner of Patrick Fitzgerald at the Scooter Libby right before the election. And I Do you think, think he's setting a perjury trap Trump. for Trump? I think he did with uh, Michael Flynn. I think Michael Flynn was uh, confessed to making false statements because they, Peter Strzok had a surprise interview with him when he didn't have a lawyer, and he had no idea that the FBI had in their hands private conversations that he'd made uh, that they had surveilled, and they and so they were line by line, asking him questions and collating them with what this private intercept. I will also mm -hmm. add, I think that if he has a good lawyer, he'll probably get a, re withdraw his confession because it was based on a surveillance that was improperly obtained. But um, I think we're going to see something like that, yeah. Because I don't think there's collusion. What, what's baffling to me is you have an investigation that its prime directive by Rob, Rod Rosenstein was collusion. And he should say, we want to go to collusion. But we don't hear the word. I, I do a Google search of collusion, and I see that all the stories are dated from uh, last summer, maybe August, until around, oh, I don't know, this September, about a year. And then all of a sudden, September, October of this year, you don't, read, you don't hear them anymore. There's a new word called obstruction. And that tells me something, that they didn't find anything, so now they're trying to go back use these surveillance things and, and keep asking people. And this is not new. This is what Patrick Fitzgerald did with Scooter Libby. He, he was supposed to investigate whether Scooter Libby had improperly disclosed the covert status of Valerie Plain. He quickly understood within weeks that she was not covert. And if she had been covert, then Richard Armitage, Colin Powell's subordinate at the State Department, had already diverged her her status to other media organizations. The fact that was known 
to Colin Powell and was told to pass it to Fitzgerald, who did not tell anybody. So Scooter Libby was pled guilty to making false statements in a contorted uh, cross-examination for a crime that didn't exist, and if it had existed, somebody else committed it before a jury, but all 12 of them were either Democrats or Green Party members. So I think that's the playbook, and it can be very successful if that's what you want to do. We had Ken Starr on the show last year, and you know, you talk about the latitude that's been given to Rosenstein. Uh, it's it's not just collusion; it's any tentacles that stem out from that. It's whatever else yeah. they find. So, whereas yeah. Ken Starr started on Whitewater, he ended up, you know, the impeachment was for a relationship, uh, a lie about a relationship that took place that that happened after the Whitewater investigation even started. Right. I mean, so, yeah, it did. this latitude that we talk about, that's what's really scary, I think, right here, because it's just where does it end? Well, it doesn't end because it sort of echoes the Stalin infamous motto is that you give me the criminal and I've got the crime already. So or yeah. out of Alice through the look, looking glass, the Red Queen, I have the crime and, then you know, let's have work backward from that premise, that deductive premise. So that's where we are now. And the, the answer, why are we here? And the answer is clear that people in the progressive left in the George H.W. Bush, if I could be so simplistic, Republican Party feel that Trump's uncouth nature and volatility and lack of previous political or military expense, uh, experience are such that it almost justifies any means necessary to nullify him, even if that means bending the law a little bit, because the, the, the ultimate ends are noble and any means necessary to obtain them are okay. Yeah. Uh, last question for you, and I greatly appreciate you taking the time with us today. Um, I want to talk about the geography of power, the growing populism yeah. we see around the globe, whether it's Brexit or migration worries into Southern Europe or here in the United States. We have a growing disdain for the centralized bureaucrats that are being shuffled from one department to another their whole lives. You believe the power centers in Europe, NATO, the UN, and Washington, D.C. should all be broken up and dispersed across more diverse regions, representing the people, not the bureaucratic states. Your piece in Town Hall it rather tongue-in-cheekly explained how the departments can be all over the country. You could have the energy department in, in, in Houston and the interior in Utah, for example. Is that logistically possible today? Yeah, I think it is, especially in electronic age. It might not have been, say, 30 years ago, but somebody who had the Department of Energy in Houston or the Department of Labor in Youngstown, Ohio, or the Department of Agriculture in Fresno could, through Skype or electronic transmissions, be communicating all day with the administration and Congress. And it might be sort of valuable that you don't, as I said in the article, you if you're a bureaucrat or a former politician, you don't leave one office and walk the street to go and join another office, that you break up the bureaucracy, you decentralize the power. I think that's a lot of the problem is that that New York financial Washington political nexus has created a particular type of culture that's absolutely out of touch with the labor or the commercial or the agricultural needs of the people that they save, that they serve. And one of the ways would be to break up that and disperse power geographically. Do bureaucrats in D.C. have any idea how their, let's call them good intentions, you know, the policies that are enacted, nobody wants to hurt people directly, I don't think. But do they have any sense uh, or do they acknowledge or appreciate how their policies actually impact the people in Fresno, on the farms or in the oil fields, wherever it may be? Are they just completely detached from them? I don't think so. I mean, under the Obama administration, to take one example where I live, they said that if you have a low spot, and there's a lot of low spots in the San Joaquin Valley, despite being flat, and rain collected there, that that was an inland waterway, then the EPA had a right to come on your property, test that water that was, you know, ephemeral, would be gone in a week. And then if it didn't have the right chemical analysis, they would fine you. Of course, they would never do that to other people. It would only be to certain people that they felt were powerful or influential as part of the 